This is going to be a bit more applied uh, and primarily directed towards membranes, I think. I'm not sure how much time I'll have to go into membrane proteins. We'll see about that. So we chat about, uh, this far we chat about different parts like first the tutorial how to uh, use Gromex in general. We've uh, done quite a lot of talk both how to speed up your simulations and how to analyze your results both in terms of fairly simple analysis programs and also more advanced stuff like free energy simulations. So this is more specific in the sense that we're going to talk a, about a very special class of uh, biological molecules, membranes in particular. And the reason why we are doing this as a special talk is primarily that membranes are not necessarily difficult, but they're a bit different compared to the molecules normally use. For instance, they're not quite as automated as uh, it is if you simulate a protein with PDB to GMX. And there are a bit of special uh, concerns and uh, tips and tricks that you usually need to take into account when you do membrane protein simulations or membrane simulations. The protein part isn't really special. So uh, I'm going to chat a bit about why membranes are interesting in the first place, uh, about lipids. Since the reason why you need to understand something about lipids is that lipids are the molecules membranes are built of. And you do need to understand at least part uh, of the special things, what, may, what is make the, makes lipids so special to simulate and represent in force fields. Uh, lipids occur in lots of different phases, like micelles, vesicles, etc., and uh, bilayers partly have the same properties. And this is one of the reasons why bilayers are picketed simulations. You really need to get all these properties set up correctly. If you simulate them at too low or too high temperature, you're really simulating something completely different. Um, another thing that you never really see in papers is both when we and other people publish papers and simulations you basically put the reader into fair complete. Uh, we've done a membrane simulation and then you have a really short paragraph summarizing all the cutoffs and perhaps particle mesh eval you used and the size of the system. But you really never tell the reader anything about it. how did you really set up the system, how did you prepare the system, and uh, how did you manage to equilibrate this really big system with 500 lipids and a big membrane protein in it. That is, if you're lucky, we skip through that in like two paragraphs or so, or sorry, two sentences. So I'm uh, going to try to focus a bit more on these tips and tricks that you don't see in the literature. And depending on how much time we have, I'm going to show you some of these bilayer simulations, typical systems we use, uh, what we've done in membrane proteins and transmembrane helices and what other people have done, and uh, perhaps one membrane protein simulation. So uh, why are membranes important? Well, the main justification is that membranes are really, membranes really control everything that's going in and out of the cell. If you want to be able to uh, have any type of non-equilibrium distribution, for instance, a higher concentration of ions on the inside of a cell or a lower concentration or something, you do need some kind of wall here. And membranes form these walls. When it comes to membrane proteins, there are very few membrane protein structures in the protein data bank in the order of, well, 150 to 300, depending on how you count. But the main reason for this is because membrane proteins are special. This is just because it's an incredibly difficult task to crystallize membrane protein structures. 30% of eukaryotic proteins are really either pure membrane proteins in that they are located inside the membranes or at least associated with membranes like receptors. Membrane proteins are also incredibly important when it comes to drug targets. Uh, this is a bit of a stretch since both we and everybody else are saying that 50% of current drug targets are membrane proteins. They are, but of those 50%, I would say that 90% are G-protein coupled receptors. So G-protein coupled receptors are incredibly important for the pharmaceutical industry. And uh, there are still about 400 G-protein, there are about 900 G-protein coupled receptors in the human genome. And there are still about 400 of these that we have absolutely no idea whatsoever what they are doing. So lots of the virtual screening trials that go on in the industry are simply about trying to a, understand how different G-protein coupled receptors work. Unfortunately, we don't really have any good structure of any important G-protein coupled receptor. There are a couple of homologs and bovine rhodopsin is one of them. So there's a lot of work remaining to be done here and that's part of the reason why both experimentalists and uh, simulators are really interested in membrane proteins. And as David said yesterday, without membranes you die. That's justification enough, I guess. So lipids. Lipids are very different from both proteins and water. Uh, they're amphiphilic molecules, and it's even worse than amphiphilic in a way. There's not only do they have a kind of polar and... Uh, so at first they have kind of big hydrophobic part here, that are just standard hydrophobic chains. Uh, 
palmate wheel or something, but all that you really need to know that's between, say, 14 and 20 hydrocarbon groups. So standard aliphatic chains. And then you have a head group, which is not only polar, this is really an ion pair. So uh, up here you have an amine-choline group, in this case, sorry. It's a nitrogen and three CH3 groups. And on the other part of the molecule, you have a phosphate. Uh, so it's really a phosphate ion, a phosphor and then the four oxygens around it. So uh, even when you look in the force field, you actually have one formal unit charge on the choline here and uh, minus one unit charge on the phosphate. So this is going to be a huge dipole. It's really an ion pair that just happens to be connected. This head group is then connected through a, a series of carbons here to two glycerols, actually. Well, the reason why you call them glycerols is that the way you do the reaction when you build the lipids are, there are actually glycerols involved. Uh, so you actually end up with having two carbonyl groups, which are slightly polar, that then connect these head groups to the one or two chains. And the UPAC names used for these groups are incredibly complicated. So normally you tend to abbreviate them. So phosphocholine lipids are very common. On phosphoethanolamine lipids are also very common. These are essentially different names for these head groups. If you like sexy names, uh, you should definitely get into membranes, since these molecules have these really, really simple names like 1,2-dioleol-SN-glycerol, 3-phosphoglycerol. Uh, this is a pretty fun lipid, actually, since it's charged. Uh, there are several lipids that are charged. And this is another problem, really, that in the body, membranes are really mixtures of dozens of types of lipids, and you mean like proteins and cytoskeletons attached to membranes. Uh, if your memory is like mine, I always have a slightly hard time remembering uh, what is what here. Uh, so I, usually, I and most other people who actually work with membranes never remember any of these names, but you tend to stick with these abbreviated names. So DPPC, for instance, that's probably model lipid 1A. And the reason why some of these lips are more common than the others, that simply has to do with the amount of experiments that have been carried out with them. So DPPC is a great lipid. There's a PC head group and then two palmitoyl chains. There is another one called DMPC, which is dimeristoyl or whatever it is, phosphatidylcholine. That's two units shorter. Uh, as you see, I'm not an organic chemist. Uh, but again, uh, normally you work with DPPC, DOPG, POPE, DOPE is a pretty nice lipid too. Uh, all these lipids have two chains. There are other lipids like DPC that just has a single chain, which will cause it to uh, form a different phase. And then there are some, well, I wouldn't say special lipids, they're just as much a lipid as the other. But cholesterol, for instance, that's a classic lipid too. Depending on the size of these, uh, both the head groups and the chains, lipids can occur in slightly different forms. So this small DPC lipid, for instance, which has a reasonably charged normal polar head group and then just a single chain, these will tend to stick together much like uh, a small micelle. So it's kind of spherical with the head groups pointing out and the hydrocarbon chains pointing towards the center of this uh, sphere. When you increase the concentration of these types of lipids, they will essentially form, there are all kinds of funny phases here, like this hexagonal phases and everything. Uh, and uh, if you have a slightly larger lipid with two chains, they tend to form either planar membranes or at high concentration, they will form entire vesicles. So you can think of a vesicle like as a mini cell with a radius in the order of perhaps 10 or 15 nanometers or so. These are really cool. And uh, we are starting to see the first simplified simulations where people are actually working with entire vesicles and computers. I'd, uh, if you'd asked me five years ago, I would say it would take another 20 or 30 years. But computers are getting faster all the time. There, not only can these lipids occur in slightly different forms, but depending on the temperature and properties, pressure you subject these to, they have pretty complicated physical behavior. So at low temperature, say, we can work with DPPC, for instance. If you have DPPC at uh, minus uh, 20 or 30 degrees centigrade, about zero Fahrenheit, they will actually crystallize, like a real crystal, just like a protein or ice crystal or something. And in that case, all these chains will be tilted, but really, really packed. A beautiful packing of the, all the carbon hydrogens here. And, uh, well, it's a, it's a bit hard to see, but it's, uh, it's perfectly symmetrical and everything. And the head groups are packed too. So the head groups are perfectly periodic and everything. You can determine, I think there is, there might actually be one small crystal of DPPC or DMPC in the protein data bank. But that's an exception. Uh, those are pretty fun for physicists, but they are of absolutely no biological relevance whatsoever. Those crystalline phases do not occur biologically. As you're increasing the temperature and get about, say, plus 10 degrees or so, 
you will still essentially have all these chains packed, but the head groups are starting to move and uh, disorganize a bit. And the water outside here is, of course, also more liquid. And in this case, you come to something like kind of a gel phase. It's kind of sticky, the whole system, but it can move a bit. And for a very long time, I was still think that people are still arguing whether the gel phase might really occur in biological systems. I'm not sure. Uh, it is pretty rare that you simulate it. So normally when you do simulations, you work with a phase that's called liquid crystalline phase or lamellar alpha phase. And this is an example of a uh, liquid crystalline phase. And the characteristic of li liquid crystalline phase is that you can think there's a two-dimensional liquid. So all the chains are really disorganized of all these lipids. Uh, they're essentially moving like, more or less like water molecules, although a bit, a little bit slower. And uh, however, since they are amphiphilic, the hydrophobic parts will still stand to stick together and expel the water. So you have the water on each side here, and then you have a big bilayer or something. The body can uh, regulate the, uh, these different phases. Uh, for instance, the uh, distribution between uh, liquid crystalline and gel phases with cholesterol and a couple of other things. So, and that's also why there's a lot of discussion right now which phases really occurs in membranes. And I think that we would have one talk later about lipid rafts. And lipid rafts are these small, more rigid parts of membranes. And uh, people have frequently suggested that the lipid rafts might actually be closer to gel phase. Uh, I'm not sure. We'll see whether that's true or not. There is another place where liquid crystals occur, and that's like digital watches and uh, all our computer screens. These are the same type of systems, liquid crystals. So they're pretty, pretty useful. Now, if we're going to go into a cellular membrane, uh, this is a movie I got off the internet 10 years ago, uh, or five years ago at least. The funny thing, when you start getting closer to the cells, you can really see that the membranes are really, really flexible. These aren't molecules in the way you think of proteins, but rather think of it as a solvent, like water or so. It is just that they have this hydrophobic property that will cause them to well heal if you try to disrupt them. They can actually form spontaneously, as we will see in a second, too. However, they are not pure in cells. Uh, in a laboratory, you can definitely work with pure bilayers, but in cells, you have all these well, you might have cholesterol molecules sticking in there to make it more rigid. You have all these receptors or sugars, at least on the surface or so. And you will have large integral membrane proteins going straight through the bilayer to be able to tra transport things in and out. And this is rather important. Uh, because this whole, this is an example of a simulation of a, uh, of a membrane. But this whole flexible property of the membrane as a solvent really means that you can stick a membrane protein into it. Uh, I'm going to chat in a second about how we actually get membrane proteins into these systems. And in a couple of cases, you can even have nonpolar molecules go straight through the bilayer and in and out of the cell. If they're more polar like ions, you probably need a protein that's an ion channel to transport ions in and out of the cell. But all these transport properties, of course, means there's lots of interesting physics or biology, depending on how you see it going on and that you can study. Now, if you could study it, couldn't you just perform normal X-ray crystallography studies on these systems and try to determine their structure? Well, the problem is, if you want to do an X-ray crystallography study, you just need to start with the crystal. And these systems aren't crystalline, really. They're moving. They're really, really flexible. So you can't really determine what the structure of an individual lipid is. It's like trying to determine the structure of an individual water molecule. There isn't really any structure. It's moving all the time. And this is another reason why people are so interested in simulating membranes. It is darned hard to examine the structures of these on atomistic scale in the lab. There are a couple of different techniques that people use. One of them is neutron scattering, and another one is an incredibly cool technique. It's liquid X-ray crystallography. Uh, so like, you shouldn't be able to run X-ray crystallography on things that aren't crystals, but you can get one or two Fourier peaks, apparently, from the electron density. So there are ways you can at least get the electron density across the bilayer and try to deduce things like what is the density of lipids, what's the area per lipid. It's incredibly hard experiments. The other thing you can do is use NMR or EPR, spectroscopy in general, uh, to determine things like how ordered are the lipids, the parts of the lipids on average. And you know, can also use fluorescent techniques to study uh, diffusion, for instance. Uh, the nice thing for us is that all things are, all these uh, properties are really average properties. Uh, and if you're having problems with studying, for instance, an alpha helix in a protein or something, the nice thing with lipids, normally I study at least, well, when I was a PhD student, I used to study 64 lipids. Nowadays, you normally study a all these beautiful statistics. 
levels and everything. Sampling is usually not a problem with lipids when you study these local properties at least, which is great. So when it comes to the simulations, uh, there are going to be a couple of issues. Uh, first, we need to come up with a way of representing these uh, lipids in general, both some kind of parameters for them, force fields. We're going to need to create Gromax topologies for them. Uh, one way or another, you need to come up with an initial confirmation, which is not as trivial as you might think, because I said there isn't really any PDB structures of a typical membrane or even individual lipids. Since the whole thing is moving, the issue of cell shape suddenly be, starts to becoming not really problematic, but you need to think about it. What is the dimension of a uh, membrane? There isn't really any dimensions. This is an extended system. And should you apply pressure coupling through the simulation? How do you couple the pressure of these things? What type of interactions should be used? Since they're complicated, you have hydrophobic, purely hydrophobic parts without any charges. That is probably pretty easy. You, know, you wouldn't need any uh, particle mesh eval or long range interactions at all to study the hydrophobic part. And then you have, you have the head group region where these huge dipoles are really the Twitter ionic parts. And then you have the solvent outside that. So there are lots of different regions that have could be to uh, simulate. And there are also some issues with center of mass motion that we really haven't talked that much about when it comes to uh, globular proteins. It's pretty easy to uh, correct for globular proteins. But with lipids, this can really bite you, and it has bitten us at least. So when it comes to the force fields first, uh, if you think about that lipid I showed you, you essentially have a couple of, well, they can appear strange when you start, but they're really pretty standardized groups. You have a phosphate, and phosphates occur all over the place in DNA too. So there are really good force field parameters for phosphates. Sure, those are normally phosphate ions, but it's not really that much more complicated if we want to have it bound in a molecule. You have these choline groups, but those are pretty normal amines and uh, nitrogen and carbon and hydrogen groups, so they're pretty straightforward too. Glycerols, same thing there, simple organic compounds. Any normal force field should be able to uh, represent the glycerol group. And then you have the acyl chains, the purely hydro hydrophobic parts, and that should be really trivial, right? Any, nor any force field should have parameters for uh, things like methane, ethane, propane, butane, pentane, etc. So even if it's a slightly longer side chain, that should be really trivial. And then people started to simulate this, and they've tried for 20 years, and it is surprisingly hard to get good results. Uh, so if you just put this into your brand new all atom force field or united atom and try to simulate it, then you realize you get an area per lipid and volume per lipid that are in the order of 20 to 25 percent too low. Which kind of sucks. Uh, so all those really easy groups weren't that easy when you think about it. And people have uh, discussed this a lot. And it appears like the main reason why this density is too low, you can, you can cheat. And you can, the way you can test this, of course, Try to find isolated phosphides, isolated colines, isolated glycerols, and then isolated long chains. So for instance, pentadecane, which is 15 CH2 groups in a long chain. And pentadecane people have studied experimentally too. But hey, that's just a hydrocarbon, right? So that should be really trivial to simulate. So we put a couple of pentadecanes in a box 10 years ago and tried to simulate them, and you get 20% too low density. And this is with all those force fields that people have developed for 30 years or so and the tweak the parameters down to 1% and you're 20% off on long hydrocarbons. And the reason for this, of course, everybody has parameterized the force fields for really short hydrocarbons. People haven't really been interested in things longer than butane classically. Now, the good news, it is possible, though not entirely trivial, to correct this. And this has been done in a couple of kind of more or less lipid-specific force fields. So this, of course, involves tweaking the parameters and it is surprising, again, surprisingly hard to come up with parameters that are transferable at, that work both for normal molecules and for proteins. And in any case, since people working with membrane protein simulations is kind of a subcommunity, and it would probably be hard for the subcommunity to convince everybody else to switch their parameters. So people working with membranes normally, they don't necessarily come up with their own parameters, but this community has developed their own force fields. So the important thing when it comes to the membrane part, you should unless you really know what you're doing, you should not use the standard force field. You should not use the Gromax force field. You should not use Gromax 96. You should not use OPLSAA, which is otherwise a pretty good force field. You should not use Amber 99. And you should definitely not use the old Charm force field, since that was probably the worst one. The Charm 19 force field was the worst one when it came to the volume. 
There are two really good four seals that people use a lot, and one of them is uh, was made by Oliver Berger in 1997, based partly on OPLS and uh, the old Gromos Gromac four seals. That's the United Atom four seal that I'll get back to. And the other one is the very latest version of Charm, uh, where uh, Scott Feller has developed some lipid specific parameters, and that one is pretty good too. Although it's all atom, which initially you think is a big advantage, I'm going to show you that it's not. Uh, it's not a disadvantage per se, but it has other drawbacks. The Burger Force Field is available on the Gromax site in the contrib section. You can just download it. Uh, and the Charm 27, we have a beta distribution of that. We're going to have Charm 27 in the released version of Gromax pretty soon, I hope. When it comes to these topologies, then, um, as I said, there are no bilayer coordinates. And uh, to make things worse, there aren't really any standardized names, and, uh, either for the atoms or for the chains. Remember all those long names I showed you? So they were chain one. You normally have two chains. Unfortunately, the names and the, uh, the chain enumeration in those ISO uh, UPAC names are often the reverse compared to the, the order you find the chains in, in several of the structures available on the internet because they were just hacked up by somebody 15 years ago. So it's completely unstandardized. There is no standardized residue names and everything, partly because PDB structures normally only allow three letters for residue names, while most lipids use four. So, uh, well, the good news is that you can get PDB to GMX to work, but it doesn't work 100% automatically. The best option, and again, since membranes uh, are rather different, it's not the case that you get a membrane and then you uh, push this through PDB to GMX and then you simulate your membrane and next week you're simulating a different membrane. In most cases when you're simulating membrane, you have two or three PET lipids. So for instance, we tend to use DPPC, DMPC and the POP and we've used those for 10 years. So they're really, well, I wrote a DM, DPPC topology uh, nine years ago or so when I was a PhD student, it probably took me two weeks then. But then we've used those for nine years. So they're, the people actually start writing lipid topologies. There isn't really a lot of incentive for, these, for them to automate this. Since once you've written those topologies, you're gonna use them for 10 years or so. So who cares if it takes three or four days? The good news is that people in general are pretty friendly. They will share this with you. Either search on the internet or ask us or Peter Thieleman right about for these uh, topologies. They'll give them to you and we will give them to you. It is just that they're, I think we put several of them on the Gromex site. But most people, if you ask them, they'll be happy to share the topologies with you. The other alternative is to create RTP building blocks for PDB to GMX. So PDB to GMX has a cookbook where you describe molecules, for instance, like amino acids, in a pretty simple way. So you have to give them names, you have to say what atom type you should have in each position, and then you have to describe how all these atoms are connected to each other. But that is way easier than hacking a topology from scratch. And on the other hand, if you are a uh, hardcore uh, Gromex user, you, sure, it's fine. You can hack a topology manually. It's not that difficult. You're going to swear a bit the first two days, but uh, I can hack up a lipid topology manually with my student in 20 minutes or so. So it's not like a membrane with uh, 3,000 atoms. A lipid typically could have 50 atoms, united atom, and perhaps 120, 130 in all atoms. As an example of such a topology, uh, oh, this is my PhD student work. Fond memories, uh, DPPC topology, United Atom. And uh, well, there is some stuff at the beginning that I won't go through since Burke and Burke in particular has mentioned a couple of these things. But you essentially have a list of atoms. And the important thing here is the types here refer to these special lipid atoms. The nice thing since these lipid, for, the lipid force fields are membrane specific, there are only say five or 10 different types of atoms. So it's gonna be completely obvious which atoms you use for the chains and uh, which atoms, there is only one phosphor for instance, there is only, really only one nitrogen and there is only one type of uh, oxygen or two perhaps. So it's not at all as difficult as choosing the atoms for a real force field. The charges then are usually calculated from quantum chemistry for a couple of different heavy groups. Remember, there are lots of lipids, but that's because you can combine these things in many ways. Typically, there might be PC, PE, and PG head groups. So there are only three types of head groups. So if you're creating a new lipid, well, all the work might just be a matter of combining a PE head group with your, P, with your DM chain to get a DMPE lipid. And both, of the, both the head groups and the chain parts are probably available on the net. The special thing with most of the, at least the United Atom force fields, is that they use very, very special torsions in the chains. So all the things that David mentioned about using, uh, or sorry, Burke perhaps, uh, 
but using standard torsions and then one four interactions usually does not apply to lipids. And the reason for that is that it's very, very sensitive to the exact form of these uh, torsion potentials. So normally we simply skip the one four interactions completely and then we use special torsion potentials that have been tailored to give the exact right property in the acyl chains. And one of these forms is the old Rickard Bellamans torsions and I think that's the uh, dashed line here. The standard one four interaction would be the solid one. And then there are a couple of newer potentials like Kubajima for instance which is the dot dashed line here which slide, just slightly changes the barrier between trans and Gauss states. And this, scale, this will give differences in the area per lipid and everything. Again, as I said, it's extremely sensitive to these things since they are highly ordered systems. You don't need to understand anything about this just to uh, A, use the topologies or hack topologies and modify them to other things. But if you want to derive new lipid for his field, uh, again, there is quite a lot of work that has gone into this. Now, why on earth would anybody use a united atom for his field in the year 2007? Uh, that's a pretty good question. And the, the general sentiment in society seems to be that all atoms are by definition better than united atoms. And that is not true. As David has mentioned, there are quite a few cases when we've tested long-term stability of force fields, for instance, united atom force fields aren't really any worse or better, to tell the truth, than all atom ones. That is completely different from membranes. So looking at an individual lipid, here's an example of the same system represented as united atoms on your left and uh, all atoms on your right. There's a huge amount of difference due to all the hydrogens on the lipids. So you add about 80 atoms as hydrogens. And depending on the force field, all of this could have both uh, Leonard Jones and uh, Coulomb interactions. But still, that's just a factor of two or so, 2.5 perhaps. It's not horribly bad, right? Well, it's much worse since all of these atoms are really added in the hydrophobic core part of the membrane. So here we add all the hydrogens. The water already has the hydrogens. So we're tripling the amount of atoms in the center here. Going from one united CH2 atoms to C plus two hydrogens. And that means that when two of these groups are interacting, it's a three times three interactions. So the number of interactions is multiplied by nine when you go from united to all atoms. And sure, this is not the entire system, but about half the system. So we benchmarked this a couple of times. I don't remember the exact number, but you can count in the order of four to five times uh, simulation speed difference. It's going to be about five times slower to run an all atom simulation. Now, that would be fine if uh, we got much better results from the all atom simulations, but uh, well, you shouldn't trust me since the United, we've kind of been involved in developing the United Atom Force Fields, but Steve White's group and several other people, they've tested and compared, for instance, the brand new Charm All Atom Force Fields for lipids with the older Berger one. And there's absolutely nothing wrong with the Charm Force Field, but it doesn't provide any better results than the Berger. The results are just as good, to tell the truth. But if the results are just as good and there is a factor of four or five difference, I find it very hard to motivate why you should go with the all atom force field. It is not more accurate just because it has more atoms. It is more accurate if it can provide better results, but that has this far not yet been shown. Now, to get the bilayer formation, uh, again, a very, very good idea is ask people, if you're interested in a big, uh, you're reading a paper and say, by fiscal journal, that's a common place to find the membrane simulations. And uh, say that Eric Lindahl or Peter Thielemann has published this big simulation of 256 lipid system and done something, and you're interested in that, ask them. They will probably give the coordinates to you, and that's going to save you two months of headaches trying to create a lipid topology. Since again, it's not that people are keeping this private, but since there isn't any repository like PDV for protein structures, most authors tend not to publicize these things on the internet since they're huge anyway. And, uh, there isn't really, it's not that fun just to publish in PDB files with coordinates. It's not particularly useful. We'll share them. The other thing you can do is you can kind of use these, when you have any set of uh, lipids, for instance, a very big system, 1024 lipids, or a very small system with 64 lipids, you can use the standard Gromax tools that you normally use for any system to change the size. Gen Conference is a program that you can take entire boxes as Lego building blocks and just repeat them multiple times if you want a membrane that's four times larger, or four times four, 16 times larger. You can use gem box that we use to add water molecules to a normal box, and we can add lipids. You can even take a uh, system that's a mixture of water and lipids, and it will add this mixture of water and lipids to your system. 
So you can think of them, use your memories as you would use any other solvent. And of course, at one stage they started. Uh, so uh, what, we, what, what both we and others did uh, 10 years ago was you take a single lipid confirmation and then just repeat this lipid 64 times, eight by eight. And then you have to equilibrate for a very long time in vacuum, probably 50 nanoseconds or so. 10 years ago, we couldn't simulate 100 nanoseconds easily. So what we normally did is we took these single lipids and then we randomly first tilted them one way or another and then tried to rotate them to get some kind of, well, mixed up distribution of the states and uh, then equilibrated for say 10 or 20 nanoseconds. That still took several months. Uh, and sure, nowadays 20 nanoseconds of simulation isn't that much, but there is really no point in redoing all these steps where you can get membranes that people have already simulated for 100 nanoseconds. Normally what we do, when we need a new membrane, we take the last membrane that we had from the previous uh, article. Since the longer we continue, the better equilibrated they will be. The other th uh, fun thing that you can do now is actually, you don't need to assume anything. You can actually simulate the formation uh, of the natural way. So we did this a couple of years ago. So you can just put lipids, DPPC for instance, and uh, water in some kind of medium sized box. We repeat the system here. So here's the box. And then all these steps take in the order of 30 to 100 nanoseconds, depending on how lucky you are. But actually membranes will form uh, with lipids in the middle here and then water on the sides naturally in simulations. And people are, one of the hot topics right now is that people are trying to redo this for vesicles, to get vesicles to fuse and form vesicles. And I'm sure they'll be successful, but it's gonna take slightly longer. Right, so now we have membranes and we have uh, at least some sort of topologies for them, so we could start simulations. However, there are a couple of other things to think about. One problem is that membranes are big and large. In worst case, 1,000 lipids or so. And that's okay, they, there might be 100,000 atoms in a big membrane system, you can simulate 100,000 atoms. However, what really comes back to bite you is that not only are these systems larger, the relaxations are an order of magnitude slower too. Lipids are larger than water, so it's gonna take in the order just for a lipid to relax and kind of shake its legs, <laughs> this acyl chains, it takes in the order of 10 nanoseconds. So if you want lipids to relax around a membrane protein, you're gonna need a 50 nanosecond simulation just for the equilibration. So not only are they 10 times larger, you also need 10 times longer simulations. So now you're 100 times more costly in the simulation. And the way to get around this is uh, to try to shrink the box size, of course, to make the system smaller. And it's quite fine, you can use rectangular boxes. So this is from the side and this is from the top. And uh, here we have a small helix, this works fine. And the distance to the side here could be two nanometers or so. And the distance between the periodic copies could be four. On the other hand, just as we spoke on uh, in the tutorial introduction on in this Monday, the diagonal size here is much larger, of course, that one times four, the square root of two times the distance there. So we have, we have an unnecessarily large amount of lipids in the corners here. So couldn't we get rid of that? We can. Membranes, that's the case when you want these hexagonal boxes. So what you really want is a box that looks like that. Well, you, what you really would want is a circle, of course, but the circle isn't periodic. So we we'll may have to make do with something that we can put periodic copies on. So in this case, we have a molecule here. We would have a copy here, 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 and here. If you trust me for a while that it is possible to do the, all the crystal symmetry operations and everything in these shapes, it's gonna be a pain. So what we do in Gromax that Tank Becker proved several years ago is that all these cells can be represented with triclinic cells. So this system is exactly equivalent. What you've done is essentially moved a couple of these blocks to other places. Normally in Gromax, we work with the triclinic cells everywhere internally. So this is not even something you have to enable. You can just, uh, unfortunately you can't uh, tell PDB to GMX to create a, the uh, hexagonal box for you automatically. But again, since we normally don't use PDB to GMX, that's less of an issue here. What you will get if you just open one of these simulations in Gromax and you think it's triclinic, you will still get a periodic box that looks rectangular. The reason for this has to do with the neighbor searching as Burke mentioned the other day that this part of the system is really in that part of the uh, triclinic cell. But the periodicity is still along the triclinic vectors. So here you have one protein, the next protein is not there, but there. Uh, and as I said, this uh, magic program TRJCon can uh, convert between all these uh, shapes depending on what you want. 
but they're really equivalent inside Gromax. And that might not seem like a big deal, but it saves you 14% immediately. It is 14% as a free lunch. So uh, don't underestimate the importance of all these uh, crystal cells. Now when it comes to the interactions, you would need to create an MDP file for membranes too. And uh, the worst problem here is actually the Coulombic interactions, in particular before you had PME. The reason I actually implemented PME in Gromax was that I had all these pains with my membrane simulations not working. The horrible thing is that these cutoffs are bad. They are very, 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 very bad for membranes. So you have the huge ion pairs as the dipoles. So just forget about cutoffs. At one time, both we and others were using cutoffs at 1.8 nanometers, almost twice the normal range. Not only is that expensive, it is even more expensive than PME. It is worse. So just say no. Do not use cutoffs for membranes for the Coulombic part. It's stupid. Reaction field, unfortunately, yeah, reaction fields have lots of advantages to it, but it assumes an isotropic and homogeneous systems, and you can say lots of things about membranes, but they are not isotropic and they are not homogeneous. So just forget about reaction field too. You can't use reaction field for membranes. And that leaves us with PME. The good thing with PME is that PME with a cutoff of one nanometer is about 30% faster than a long range cutoff of 1.8 nanometer. So not only is it better, it is faster than the old cutoffs too. The currently released version of Gromax has some PME scaling issues, but that is entirely solved in CVS. And CVS scales beautifully to, I think, guess that's what Burke is playing with right now. Uh, on the new cluster here, we have PME scaling to 512 nodes at least. And the other thing that PME in theory is very, very hard to do in this complex uh, periodic cells. Don't worry about it. Triclinic cells takes care of everything. PME just works in hexagonal cells in Gromax. The van der Waals interactions are easier in a way. And uh, the van der Waals interactions, it actually turned out that the main problem with all these force fields was that the van der Waals interactions weren't really parameterized to get the density of these long chains correct. And just changing the van der Waals radius by one or two percent, that won't have a lot of effect on ethane or propane or butane, these small molecules, but on the long chain, it do, thus. To make a long story short, standard cut cutoffs or switches, it doesn't really matter. Around one nanometer, the same thing as you use for the PME, is fine. However, do turn on the long range dispersion corrections. If you remember from the, the talk the other day, the dispersion corrections accounts for the fact that although the Leonard Jones interactions decay pretty rapidly, at long distance, all Leonard Jones interactions are attractive. So you kind of compensate for this by calculating what should the average attraction be for all atoms in the entire system. And then you do an integral correction for this. And that can adjust, that can affect your pressure by a couple of percent, two or three percent. So it's not horribly bad, but uh, all these membrane force fields are normally parameterized with long range dispersion correction turned on. The other issue, as I said, is these are really two dimensional liquids or liquid crystals. Uh, it should be able to deform in the XY plane and fluctuate. And that's kind of important since many of the properties of membranes, for instance, if you have membrane proteins, so the lipids need to be able to flow around these. So normally you should always <coughs> allow the pressure, or rather the system should be able to deform, not only during equilibration, but even throughout your simulation. So with membranes, you normally enable pressure coupling throughout your production runs. And that leads to some other issues. So since first, since it's not an isotropic system, you should normally allow anisotropic pressure coupling. So you should be able to scale the Z, X, and Y dimensions independently of each other. The Z direction is normally the normal. So the, X, the membrane is in the X, Y plane. That's another one of those things that is more or less assumed that you know, that you understand when you read a membrane paper, that the membranes are always in the X, Y plane. So Z is the normal. And that works, but it can be a problem since there's really nothing to prevent the membrane from distort. This is X and Y planes are uh, equivalent. So in theory, if you have a big system, what could happen is that the X dimension could narrow indefinitely while it extends in the Y dimension. So instead of having four by four nanometer box, you could have a box that's going to 16 times one nanometer. And at that point, you're gonna start having problems that a lipid can see the periodic copy of itself. And at some stage, Gromex is gonna stop and crash and say that, sorry, the box is distorting too much. And that's not really a limitation. Uh, the, prob the problem here is that physically that can happen. Of course, for a system that is large enough, it's gonna be incredibly improbable, so it will never happen in our bodies with 
60, uh, 10 to the power of 30 lipids or so. There is a pretty smart trick in Gromax that you can use to get rid of this. So we essentially lock the X and Y dimensions with something called semi isotropic coupling. And this is, pro this is present in the MDP file. And that means that we scale the X and Y dimensions to maintain the uh, relative, uh, uh, was it the, uh, the relative uh, dimensions there. So if you, if you scale the X dimension up by 10%, you're also scaling the Y dimension up by 10%. And uh, then you have a separate uh, coupling for the Z direction. That works great. Uh, and then you can publish a simulation and when you submit your paper, you will get an angry referee response back saying that you use Behrens and pressure coupling and this does not provide a true NPT ensemble. Well, that is formally correct. And that's one of the reasons for this is that there has been a lot of discussion about all these recipes, how you should simulate membranes as the density has been too low in many cases. So it's probably passing right now. And in particular, if you're using your lipids as a passive solvent for a protein, people don't care. But if you're trying to publish pure membrane simulations, it is probably better to use this paradidyl or Raman thermosets. It's a bit more kosher to the physicists. So in theory, at least, paradidyl or Raman should guarantee you a correct MPT ensemble. So it's, I'm not going to say, you prob to tell the truth, I've never seen the thermostat affect any of the results we are interested in. But if you're going to do pure membrane simulations, use paradidyl or Raman. It's going to save you some headaches in the review process. The other issue is that in this case, if you simulate things for 10 or 100 or even 1,000 nanoseconds, a microsecond, it's quite fine to use very, very slow relaxation, 100, 10 or even 100 picoseconds. So the point here isn't that you don't want the membrane to oscillate. You just want it to be able to deform very, very slowly. The compressibility, I won't go into details here. You get a PDF copy of this. Uh, but it's actually possible to even allow the cells to distort. So you can force the system to go from a rectangular box to a hexagonal thing. So you can do really, really advanced stuff with the Paranel Raman uh, biostats. The thermostats, the only thing there I think is important is that you should use separate thermostats for lipids and water since they're not always particularly coupled. And there are also these issues. If you constrain the bonds in an orient system, you could in theory get an an temperature anisotropy and some other horrible things. So, Separate groups for water lipids and the protein if you have it. Center of mass motion, not a problem for normal. Normally you remove the center of mass motion for the entire system and that works fine with the protein in water. The problem again, since you have different parts, you usually have water out here on both sides and they have lipids here and they have another layer of lipids here. And that really means that there is nothing, again in a globular system, if the upper layer of the lipids here is moving left, there would be other lip, it would really have to diffuse out in the rest of the world and there would be other lipids stopping them. The problem here is that if all these lipids start getting a slight net velocity to the left, when they come to the left here, they are gonna hit the same lipids on the other side that are also going left. So you can actually get a net increasing velocity of each layer of lipids. So the upper layer could go left, oh sorry, the upper layer could go right here while the lower layer goes left. So when you do the center of mass motion coupling here, and if you want correct diffusion properties of the lipids, you really should couple the water, upper layer, and lower layer separately. And that is really easy to do in Gromax. As long as these are defined as groups, you can just say center of mass motion groups should be upper, lower, and sol, for instance. And doing that, you can actually calculate lipid diffusion pretty neatly. Just as an example, and a memento mori to that you need long simulations, this is a tiny system with 64 lipids. And over 100 nanoseconds, one lipid isn't even traversing the entire box. It's kind of, yeah, it's starting moving a couple of nanometers, but it's an order of magnitude slower than water. Now, I'm gonna, running a little bit short in timer, so I'm just gonna show you a couple of things that you can do to analyze lipids. I have about five or six slides left, I think. And uh, then two or three slides about membrane proteins. So first you can calculate electron densities that fit really nice with experiments. There's a program G underscore density in Gromax to do that for you. All these order parameters that are pretty complicated things that you normally get from NMR spectroscopy. Bang, not a problem. G underscore order. Gromax has a finished analysis tools for this. So you can calculate, and let's see, the solid line here are our calculated values and the uh, circles here are the experimental ones. So this fits pretty nicely with the order parameters from experiments. You can do things like undulations and try to measure how much are these membranes moving and how 
expensive is it really the bending modulus to distort the membranes? And if you gradually add cholesterols, as people imagine the body does, to stiffen up membranes, you see exactly that. As you're increasing the amount of cholesterol, the membranes get stiffer and stiffer. So there's quite a lot of fun physics you can do on these membranes. <laughs> Sorry, I'm gonna skip that slide. Now, that is the membrane part, and that's really the reason I spent almost all the time that it's really the membrane part that is hard about the membrane simulations. Membrane proteins makes for really complicated systems, but really the membrane part we've already covered. You can use a standard force field for the, oh, sorry, the protein part we've already covered. You can use a standard force field for the protein part. The only problem with the force field part is really that you're gonna need a way to combine a membrane force field and a uh, protein force field. The other thing is that you need to come up with a way to solvate this protein in the membrane, which with Gromax at least turns out to be way easier than you think. So just prepare your protein or helix, whatever it is, without the membrane, and then you solvate it just as you would solvate a membrane protein in water. Use GMBOX, but instead of providing the SPC solvent, you provide a membrane, a finished pre-equilibrated membrane as your solvent. And GMBOX will just happily add in all these lipids and water and everything and cut out the molecules that are overlapping with your protein. It works great. The only thing that you have to make sure is that you get the membrane at the correct Z coordinate so that it's not putting the protein out in the solvent. But that's fairly easy. Then you have to apply a bit more of care during equilibration here. So you essentially start by freezing the protein completely for a couple of times with these two options in the uh, MDP file. And then it's also a good idea, since you cut away a couple of lipids close to the protein, you don't want the water to come down here because then it's gonna take forever before it goes out again. So what you normally do is that we apply a restraint so the water can relax in the X and Y plane, but it can't move down in the Z coordinate. That's really easy to do. Just add a single line in your MDP file. So we want a position restraint on the water. So fine, we don't restrain it in the X coordinate, we don't restrain it in the Y coordinate, but God damn it, they can't move in the Z coordinate. And then you equilibrate this for like 10 nanoseconds or so, and hopefully the lipids will have packed nicely around the protein. Once you've done that, we release the water again, and then equilibrate it for another 10 nanoseconds or so, and take some care and look, okay, if water is still entering through the lipids and protein, you might have to go back and redo this again and perhaps uh, remove the water. But it's, it's not necessarily that it's difficult, it is just that in contrast to taking 10 minutes when it's a protein in water, it could take a week or so to equilibrate a uh, membrane protein in a membrane. But it's not really exceptionally hard, just tedious work. Now, uh, when it comes to mixed lipid and protein force fields, it is pretty easy. Since the Berger force field is entirely based on OPLS and partygromos, we can just mix it with OPLS AA. I think that is present on the site. If it is not, ask me, I'll be happy to give it to you. Charm 27 is fine too, as I said, particularly in the beta, but it is more expensive on average. And again, you could use the OPLSAA Amber Gromos forces if you really had to, but try to stay away from them. Uh, and finally, the United versus All Atom issue. Don't think that all atoms is better just because you see more coordinates. Those are mostly fake. All these force fields, the charges and the hydrogens, they're more or less guesses anyway. It's extremely hard to parameterize the hydrogen charges. So when it comes to membranes, it works great with the United Atom force field. The United Atoms force fields are not older. They're not an approximation of the all atom force fields. There's a very, very smart way to get a four or five times performance improvement almost entirely free. And Sure, there could be cases where you can imagine that these weak dipoles could be important, but in principle, we've never seen it. We've even done very recent stuff that we'll show you the final slide on, where we tried to determine the uh, free energy of solvation of amino acids in membranes. And in particular, for polar charged amino acids, because it could be incredibly important to have those weak dipoles. But it's working great. Uh, the solvation energy of amino acids in the Berger force field is essentially within one kilojoule per mole, sorry, within one kcal per mole, and since it's very hard to determine these experimentally, that's within the experimental certainty. So there's absolutely nothing wrong with United Atom force fields. If you want to waste a factor of four more CPU cycles on the all atom version, please go ahead, but don't think it's better because there are more atoms. I think that was all I had. Thank you very much. <laughs>